Peace everyone, Unmaskard here. Welcome to the Drawing Journal. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about some coloring processing. And uh, as you can see, I'm working on this horse. I started this with a, a Patreon student and we were kind of working through this uh, horse project with colored pencils together. And while I started my project, um, I decided to try something, kind of a different approach to what I usually do when when coloring just about anything. And uh, today I'm going to talk about what I learned with this kind of experimentation um, of my coloring strategy. Uh, I, I've done a lot of tutorials on YouTube and I go through um, I go through kind of a procedure when it comes to coloring, when it comes to painting, pretty much anything that has to do with color. I, I have like this this list of check marks that I go through and I kind of have been um, complacent in going through those steps over and over and over again for many years now. And uh, as I've developed as an artist, I've gotten, I've gained more experience to like branch out and try something different. And that's what I wanted to do with this when I started coloring it. And as you can see, I haven't finished it. And the reason I stopped, the reason I stopped coloring is because I wanted to do this on, on today's drawing journal. I wanted to talk about w what changed in my strategy and what made coloring this particular horse um, so exceptionally easy in comparison to uh, my previous kind of coloring strategy. And it's, it's almost like it's a color strategy, but it's also kind of a, a way of thinking about approaching. Um, so I'll just kind of go through everything once I get there. Uh, first, let me just say hello to everybody in the chat, a whole bunch of you, uh, Wendy, Chrissy, Jeff, uh, Bonnie, Gabor, um, Miles, hopefully I pronounced that right, Anna, uh, Ain, Aina, uh, as Stephanie, uh, thank you all so much for coming in and uh, hanging out with me. Uh, and then also, I have a few uh, pieces of work that uh, a couple of you wanted me to go over and do kind of a critique. So I am going to start with that really quick. So let's go to the first one. First one here is by Joy. And uh, a few weeks ago, I did the critiques on the drawing journal and uh, she, had, she had sent this image for me to critique once before while she was still working on it. And then she took my feedback and I think uh, she just knocked it out of the park. Uh, this cat is very, very lifelike. The contrast, I can tell she, she heightened the contrast which made the, the cat overall look very much more three-dimensional. So excellent job, Joy. Really, there's, there's nothing that I can, uh, there, there's really nothing I can critique here. It, it came out flawlessly and you should be super, super proud of yourself. All right, the next drawing here is from Lily. And uh, this is this is a beautiful landscape. Um, I, I'm a fan of landscapes, as many of you know. Actually, just recently I did, um, if you haven't seen, I did a, a time lapse that I posted on Friday of me doing this uh, pastel kind of a landscape. I guess it would be considered a landscape, but uh, yeah, I did this pastel piece uh, on Friday. Uh, let's go back to Lily's. Um, so there's a few things that I can touch on. Uh, first off, I just want to say that I, I love the colors here. I'm a big fan of the colors. Uh, they are their fantastic color palette that you have established here. There's a few things that you can take to approach your next uh, landscape a little bit better to, to bring both depth and realism into it. Uh, the first thing is the sky. Now, um, it looks like you wanted like large billowing clouds, very soft clouds, um, but it appears as though you added like a dark gray or possibly even black on the bottom to get that kind of shadow effect to reinforce that the, the sun is high in the sky and the clouds are low and they have that cast shadow. Um, the problem with that is it, it's not quite blended the way that you would expect clouds to look. 
and it just it doesn't have the right effect. Um, if you're going for storm clouds, they they wouldn't they wouldn't be quite that dark. Um, you could get away with just a mild gray um, and some blues. Uh, the clouds would be more blue if they were storm clouds. Um, they wouldn't be so pure white as you have them here. Um, and then the other thing is, if you're trying to get the clouds to show up in your sky, um, and you need to go darker with the clouds because the clouds appear darker than the sky, then what your most likely issue is is that your sky is just too dark. Your blue is too dark. You need to go lighter with the sky. If Sometimes the clouds are the, the light part of the, the sky, in which case you make the sky a darker and deeper blue. And then other times you have that the clouds are darker than the sky and that's where you get the the shadow of the sun uh, on the bottom part of the cloud and in that case you want to flip it so that the, the sky appears to be more of a, a light gray light blue color um, and so that's that's one of the issues with the clouds the other issue with the clouds is that your their their the fluffiness that you gave them is much too pattern like and it gives it that artificial, almost cartooning, like your, um, let me get, uh, block this off. Like you're, like you're drawing your clouds like this with the same size billow puffiness um, repeatedly. And you don't want to do that. Um, you want to make sure that your clouds don't have a uniformity to them. Uh, and yours do. So if you, if you remove the uniformity, adjust the contrast and color, and just soften them a little bit more with blending. Uh, I think they'll turn out really good. And then another thing is uh, the bottom of your clouds most likely are going to be flat. They're, they're going to be horizontal because uh, you're looking up at them and they are stretched out over the sky. So the perspective will make them look flat on the top or flat on the bottom, but uh, fluffy on the top. And then, of course, as you get closer to the horizon, and, and your clouds kind of follow this rule, as you get closer to the horizon, your clouds, they get, they, they shrink more and more. They get thinner and thinner to the point that they're, they just show up as lines. Um, the, the other thing that uh, this landscape needs is depth. And the, the problem that you have here is if you look off to the left side um, over here where you see my finger um, if you look here at the horizon and then you follow the color saturation and value all the way down to the foreground you'll notice one thing it's the same the trees or brush that's way back here in the far far distance it matches the same color and value that you have all the way up here in the front and that's a problem because it breaks the rule of landscapes when you're doing landscapes in order to create that depth, the objects in the distance have to be both less saturated and have a, a lower value. So not dark, not black or anything like that. Like what you have here, it looks like a dark brown and that would be the wrong color back here in the back. You want, you want it to be kind of a smoky, uh, more grayish uh, version of your foreground color and a much lighter value. And then as you get closer, your saturation and your colors get brighter and your values get darker. As you can see, the grass that's in the background in the middle has the same colors and value as, a, as your foreground grass, which makes it feel like it's on the same plane. It's not in the distance, and that's the problem. Um, other than that, the other thing that this landscape kind of lacks is a point of interest. Uh, you have you have like a pool of water over on the right side, which is really cool, and it it brings some some brightness into the uh, foreground slightly. It's kind of the middle ground there. But you have all this empty space up front with the grass. You have this nice tree off to the right, kind of creeping in, but you don't have anything for the viewer to anchor themselves into the scene. If you had a person standing or even like an old fence post or or literally any detail up here in the front kind of popping out of your grass 
it could literally be anything. It could just be like a bush with some, some bright red flowers or something like that. Anything that uh, will capture the viewer's interest and, and, and bring them into the picture. So that's the other thing that's kind of lacking in this, in this piece. But uh, like I said, the color palette is gorgeous. I love these colors. It's very, it's very um, like late summer, early fall type colors that I feel here. Uh, so it's, it's very um, welcoming. All right, let's go to the last one here. Uh, this one is from Tammy and she did a horse. I, th I, if I'm not mistaken, this was pastels. I'm pretty sure this was pastels. Um, the first one was acrylic paint or maybe it was graphite, I can't. I, I have a hard time remembering all this. <laughs> um, Anyways, I I'm pretty sure this is pastels, and it's really, really good. This kind of detail uh, for an elephant, um, it is painstaking. There's really no easy shortcuts, and uh, the, the skin is, there's so much texture. It's kind of like doing a snake or doing a, a, any kind of reptile that has uh, the scales and the cracks, like an alligator or a lizard or something like that. And when you when you're zoomed in like this, uh, you got to get all those cracks in there uh, to make it look good. Um, there's uh, it's it's fantastic. The colors are great. The detail is great. The execution is fantastic. Um, now for some. Uh, potential room for improvement. Uh, I would say that some of the cracks on what I believe is the leg over here, they look a little too uniform. They almost look, they almost look like just cross hatched uh, sections and they don't quite have uh, the dimension because the value just doesn't seem to be changing uh, correctly for it to look like a leg. That's why I'm not even sure if it is a leg. Um, and then I actually just realized this while looking at it. Um, I believe that's a tusk uh, in the middle, that white spot. Um, and my brain was not perceiving it as a tusk. Um, if it is a tusk, I think it's a tusk. Um, but it actually just looks like a gap. It looks like you see the elephant's trunk coming down and then you have its legs off to the right and it looks like a gap. And the reason it looks like that is because the, the tusk doesn't look like a tusk, it just looks like a white gap. So it, it doesn't have any dimension to it, it doesn't look three-dimensional. And I think uh, if you make that more three-dimensional, it will really bring this kind of together a little bit more and your viewer won't be stuck wondering whether it's a tusk or just a gap. Um, the other thing uh, that I think you could just slightly improve on is the focus of the eye. Um, usually when you're doing like animal portraits like this where it's up close and you definitely have the eye here, um, you, you, you kind of want to focus the viewer's eye to the animal's eye. We have that kind of connection where we like to look into the eyes of animals and people and all of that. And generally with any portrait, any animal portrait or you know, human portrait, um, the focus is 99% is always on the eye. And for here, uh, you kind of get lost in the dark spot underneath the neck. One, it's um, it's composed almost directly in the center of the, the piece, which you kind of usually go towards. Um, and then also the, the dark value in the center there uh, pulls you in even deeper as opposed to looking at the eye. I feel like uh, you could take some artistic liberty to bring more focus to the eye by like deepening, uh, darkening, using like a true black, really darkening the shadows and the texture around the eye, and then also giving the eye a highlight. Even if it doesn't show up in the reference photo, splash in a few speckles of white to make the eye look glossy, to make the eye pop off the page in comparison to all the other middle to dark values that you have. Um, anyways, that is it for uh, the critiques. I Maybe you guys missed uh, the post in, in the Unmasked Family group um, that I did last week. Uh, asking for you to uh, post your work or you just uh, haven't been as creative as uh, you wanted to because um, I only got three submissions uh, which I you know I'm not gonna complain uh, but I, I expected there to be more 
Uh, let me see. I think I got a few more people in the chat. Uh, Janice, uh, Joanna, um, Brenda. Hello, everyone. Tumblr Re, uh, Paulo. Good to see you as well. Um, anyways, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me, and I'm gonna get started in explaining uh, my new uh, my my new coloring process. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, real quick, I'm working. This is the first time I've worked on this paper. Um, and if anybody remembers, I, I, I always said that uh, I never liked using colored pencils on watercolor paper. And uh, I, my mind changed a little bit, okay? It changed a little bit because um, I am using Fabriano Artistico hot press watercolor paper um, and it's really thick. It's 300 pound watercolor paper. I bought this paper like a year ago and I, I never used it. Um, oh, hello, Iris. Um, yeah, I bought this paper like a year ago. I never used it and I decided, you know what? I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna grab a sheet of it. I cut it really small. This, this drawing is rather small, but um, the, uh, the paper is working out super good, and I actually like it quite a bit with the colored the, with the colored pencils. And I'm just using uh, my Prismacolor color pencils on the paper. Uh, it does take a little bit to dry when I use solvent to blend, but uh, overall, uh, I definitely give this paper a thumbs up, and I'll be using more of it in the future uh, to do some of some more projects. But anyways, let's get into the coloring process because I'm sure a lot of people are um, wondering what uh, what this new coloring process is and how I came up with it. Um, and I kind of just I kind of I, I came up with it as an exercise for myself, and I do this rather often because I like to uh, kind of push myself and, and always try to keep myself outside of my comfort zone. Uh, that way, I'm always progressing. No matter how much, no matter how much I progress as an artist, I always feel like there's room and room for improvement. And um, so I'm always, I'm always, you know, going outside my comfort comfort zone, trying something different, and uh, trying not to repeat the same processes over and over again. Uh, because if I do that, then I I would it would be reasonable to expect the same results over and over again. So um, for this for this uh, horse here, uh, it is a, it, it's obviously it's a fur animal. And uh, when I teach how to color fur animals, whether it's with pastels or with colored pencils, I'm always stressing about the direction that the pencil is going. With, uh, what direction the fur is going, what direction the hair is growing, and keeping those things the same. Uh, but with this horse, it has a very tight, short fur, so I kind of ignored those, those rules that I'm usually saying over and over again. I wanted to try something different with this horse. And what I did is I ignored the fact that I was coloring a horse completely. Uh, obviously, I had this. I sketched it before I started filling it in with color. But what I did is I broke it down into colors rather than uh, just looking at it as a horse and kind of working in the details. And I left this part down here to uh, to talk you through how I'm thinking about it, so that maybe you can um, you can try this process out. Um, on your next project or something like that. And I would definitely recommend um, I would definitely recommend taking what I say today and, and trying it on a little practice piece like this. Um, it, it could be anything, it could be anything. But doing, you know, just do a small study like I'm doing here. This is just a practice piece. It's not gonna hang up in a museum anywhere. It's way too small. Um, but rather than thinking about drawing a horse, what I did is I only focused on colors and shapes. And when I, t when I say that I only focused on colors, what I'm talking about is I, 
I, I looked at the reference photo. I, I picked out a color. Uh, in this case, I picked out the color of the shadow, the darkest, the deepest shadows. And it's, it's like, it's next to black. It's basically black, a little bit of gray, a touch of brown, um, all kind of mixed in there to match that color perfectly. The only thing I was concerned about was matching the color. I didn't care that I was coloring a horse. I didn't, I didn't look at anything other than the fact that I wanted to match the one color, just the one color, because this color appears throughout the horse um, a lot. In fact, I think I might be able to let me, um, I know what I'll do. I'm going to show you the reference photo. Where's it at? I can, I, I should be able to bring this in. So let's go here. Yeah, I'm going to show you guys a reference photo really quick. Let me just uh, do that. I think it's here. Yeah, okay. Now I need to fix it. That way I can, uh, show you guys exactly what I am talking about. Okay, so here's the reference photo, and here's my drawing, obviously. Um, <clears throat> the first color that I was looking at was this dark shadow that you see like down the center of the neck the dark shadow, and then underneath the jaw, underneath the snout, and over by the lips, by the nose, that dark reddish, blackish, uh, grayish brown color. Uh, and it's very dark, it's next to black, but it's not black. It's not pure black. I would say the only pure black is like the crease of the mouth, the nostril and the eye, and uh, the hair. Uh, and what you can do is you can, you can kind of lump in you can, you can lump in the true black with this dark reddish brown and even the dark parts of the lips. And if you ignore everything about this, this photograph here and you only look at those dark areas and you, you look at the shapes that they make, you have a lot of little triangular shapes uh, around the the anatomy on the face right down the, the snout. Uh, you obviously have the eye itself, and then you have uh, kind of curves, curved spots uh, around the eye here that separate the eyelid from a wrinkle of skin. Uh, you have the crease of the mouth. Uh, you have some shapes here. You have uh, several shapes here. Uh, you have a little spot here. You have this spot right here behind the jaw. Uh, you have these little lines running up the ears, you have the hair, um, and then of course you have the center of the neck right here. And all I did, all I did uh, in the, the, the process that I thought of was, okay, I'm, I'm just going to match that color. All I'm going to do is focus on this color first, uh, and this is when all I had was a sketch. Um, all I had was a, the, a, the graphite sketch laid down. And what I did is I, I matched this color and I used, these are the three colors that I used to match it. I used dark umber, which is 947, uh, warm gray, 90%, which is 1058, and then I used black, Prismacolor. Uh, and then all I did was draw in those shapes. I just filled them in. I didn't press real hard. I used, I used my rule that I'll probably always keep, which is never press harder than you need to for the color to show up. Um, so I just colored them in, focused on matching the color and the shape. That's it. I ignored the fact that I was coloring a horse completely. All I looked at was the shapes that the dark shadow was making. And then I used a brush and some zest it to blend it out so that it was soft. Um, the next thing that I did was I went onto the other side of the color spectrum. I went straight to the highlights. So you see uh, these parts uh, on the top of the eyelid. Uh, you have this kind of zigzag shape of a highlight running down its snout right here. You have a little bit on the lip. You have a bit here on the cheek, right here by the ear, right here at the edge of the ear, the back of the head a little bit. You have 
these bright shapes. And what I did is I to match the color, I just used a 927, which is the, the light peach color. And I drew those shapes. Again, I completely ignored what I was coloring. All I focused on was the shape that I could uh, lay down with that color. Because the color is so light, it's safe to go a bit uh, bigger than the highlight actually is on the horse because then I can later on use the darker colors to shrink that highlight down to size, down to the size that I needed to be in order to look correctly. Um, I think my, one second, my exposure is a little bit high here. There. My exposure was a bit too high on my camera. Now it looks a bit better. Um, but uh, that's, that's what I did. I drew in the shadow shapes matching the color. I drew in the highlight shapes matching the color. That, that was the first two steps. The, the next step was to find the middle ground, uh, focus on the kind of orange, yellow, reddish type fur that showed up. And again, I focused on matching the color. I didn't care that I was working on fur. I didn't care that I was working on a horse or anything. All I focused on was matching the color. Even if that took, you know, um, two or three trials of error, uh, the, 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 the one focus that was constant throughout this, this process so far was just making sure that I matched the color. And there's a number of tools you can do to analyze your colors. You can download an app on your phone or iPad or whatever um, that uh, makes color charts. Uh, I don't have one, but I know they exist somewhere. Uh, the other thing is you can use Photoshop to do it, which is what I usually do. I use Photoshop and then I use a color picker uh, to kind of branch out, isolate my colors, and then analyze them, and then select them from my collection of pencils. Uh, the other thing is there's pixel art, which is basically kind of like a free Photoshop through a browser online. Um, and if you, if you guys, if anybody knows how to spell pixel art, type it in the chat for people to know. Uh, I, I didn't think I was going to bring it up, otherwise I would put it, put a link to it in the description. But it's free and you can do everything that I'm discussing. Uh, just like I do in Photoshop. You know, you bring in a picture, use an eyedropper tool to select a color, and then isolate it so that you can... I did do a tutorial on this process like three years ago, feels like, or could be even longer, but it's how to create a, an effective color palette. So I do have a tutorial on it. Um, yeah, so that was the, that was, that's the basis. That's the mindset that I went into when coloring this this horse here. It was all about identifying a specific color and then matching it as best as I can and then applying it. Applying it with no regard to what I'm, to the object that I'm actually trying to create here. And the reason that I removed the concept of I'm coloring a horse, it has fur, I'm you know, I got to be careful. I have to worry about, you know, the anatomy. I have to worry about the values. I need to worry about, um, I don't know. I have, the things that you worry about because you want the horse to look good. You know, that's, most people want their artwork to look good. And when they're working with colors, they're always worried about the same things. They're always worried about going too dark worried about making a mistake and not being able to correct it. And when, when you're working with colored pencils, um, there's not a whole lot of room for error. And so what you get when you have color fear and you're working with colored pencils is that you get washed out drawings. You get colors that aren't fully applied, fully saturated, and you don't cover the paper completely. You usually end up leaving little specks of paper and the, the drawing looks like this. This is, uh, a, a whole bunch of the paper is still showing up through here. I didn't finish this section of the horse. I have pretty much from here 
pretty much only that is complete. And you can see uh, with the reference photo there just how close it is to the reference photo, even though I was never uh, thinking about coloring horse, I was always just trying to match the color. All right, I'm gonna get rid of that reference photo really quick. Um, yes, so, so that was my process, that was my mindset. And uh, now that I have that out, um, I'm gonna start coloring now. Now, once I got once I got to a certain part on the face where I felt like my colors, my values, and everything were matching, it was only at that point that I started applying uh, texture. You know, I was doing some of the the final details, and I started adding in some of the fur texture. I started looking at the picture as a horse, but it already looked a lot like a horse just by matching the colors. And then once I started adding in, you know, little specks uh, from the whiskers around the, the lips, the little cracks, some of the little uh, specks of colored hair that come through here, and then of course the fur all being brushed this way across its cheek, that's when I started adding in those very subtle details. Uh, and it went from it went from good to great at that point. But the main focus, the main focus of what I'm trying to get across today is just the um, the coloring strategy. Let's see. I'm just making sure I didn't miss any questions. I know I was talking there for a while. Hello, Steve. I didn't see you come into the chat. Good to see you. All right. Uh, hello, Max. Um, I am the best teacher. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, it is my pleasure, certainly. Um, yes, let's go ahead and start some coloring um, I'm going to use my dark gray here and I'm just going to continue blocking in my deep dark shadows uh, I'm using the 1058 I'm not going straight to black even though it's very very close to black but I can use this to start just mapping out just just mapping out where all the dark dark spots of the, the fur are and this I don't have to have any I don't have to have any fear about applying this color because um, I'm not I'm not coloring a horse right now the only thing I'm coloring is a shape I see the shape and I know the color I know the color because I matched it and I know that it is a combination I know that it's just a combination of these three colors and that's it. So if you can draw if you can draw weird shapes and you can just color them any color you want, that's all you have to do. Find the shape, then find the color, match the color, and then color in the shape. That is that is all I did for this project. And it significantly increased my ability to work past color fear because I, I know that I know that color fear is something that just about every artist struggles with it's so difficult and it, and it took me a long time to get past it uh, I'm still working through it it's like um, I don't know for some reason as artists uh, we are all traumatized by color we are just something happened in our childhood that makes us scared to death of color and applying it completely so uh, we're all just like creating over and over again as as therapy to get over whatever traumatic event happened uh, that caused us to be afraid of color um, and this is just a, ne a new therapeutic approach 
that uh, that I am employing to uh, to work past my trauma. <laughs> I, you, you'll notice that I'm not taking any regard to the direction that the fur is is supposed to be growing. Um, I don't even... It's, it's actually going down like this. It's all going this way. Um, but I'm not concerned about the direction of the fur, and you, you, you don't get that a lot from me. Um, um, interesting method. I might try this myself on my next project. Are you going to color the background as well? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to color the background. Um, had I colored the background, I would have already done it because I never, ever, ever suggest doing the background before the or doing the foreground subject before adding in the background. Uh, I mean, the background's just kind of like a solid blue with a, a little fluffy cloud. Um, I have no intention of adding the background. Like I said, this was just a practice piece, and for my Patreon student that um, that wanted to, to do a horse, uh, I I thought it was more important to to focus on the subject rather than just a flat blue, uh, slightly gradiated blue sky background. So we just focused on the horse and skipped to the background. Um, and then Steve, you asked, um, yeah, this this is not something that's on Patreon. Um, so for those of you that, uh, don't follow me on Patreon, I have a few levels or do follow me on Patreon. I guess it doesn't matter at this point. Um, uh, I have the, the streaming level that you have access to all of my, my live tutorials that I do every week. Uh, and then I have the collector, um, tier that, uh, I send out prints of the work that I complete and you also get access to the, the tutorials. And then there's a student level tier, um, which I only take on five students a month. Um, and I think they're all taken at this point, um, unfortunately, if you are interested in that. Uh, but what the student level tier is, is it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, once a month. Uh, so you get access to all the tutorials and everything, but you also get access to a, a, a private uh, Google Hangout with with me, where we work on a project of your choice in a in a medium of your choice, and we just I just teach you what you want to learn when it comes to art, um, and yes, that's so that is what this horse is from is from a a personal uh, class that I have with one of my students. Um, So you won't find this on on, on Patreon, Steve. You always color the background after. See, there's okay. So there's a reason why I don't suggest doing that. Um, when I have a subject here already colored in, it means that if I want to do the background, I have to work around it, which means my lines go like this. When I color in the background, all my lines go like this. And they work around the subject. I mean, you can do circles or whatever, but either way, uh, you have to you you get a halo effect because you're constantly working around a shape, and you never get like it fully consistent for that reason. But if you do the background first, if you happen to cross over into your main subject, it's usually fixable, and it usually me, you're you're usually going to be putting stuff on top of that, which means you don't have that halo effect as much, um, if at all. Especially if you cover your foreground subject. If you were to cover your foreground subject with tape or masking film or masking fluid or or whatever, depending on your medium, uh, then the background. You know, you could uh, you could cover. Uh, you could cut out masking film to block off the horse, and then you could airbrush the background because it's just blue. But um, yeah, back to front is is what I recommend doing. Uh, 
I'm just going to kind of cut the drawing off right here. It stops right here, I think, on the reference photo. Like, but uh, I kind of overextended. All right, I'm going to add some brown to my shadow here. And some more brown here as well, because that dark shadow coming up uh, has a bit more brown in it. But again, I'm not I'm not looking at uh, I'm not looking at the direction the fur is going or anything anything actually related to a horse. I'm literally only looking at this weird this weird shape of dark this weird dark shape. That's all it is to me right now. It's just a weird dark shape. It's not fur, it's not a horse. Just a weird dark blob. Now there's a another dark blob right next to it. Very, it's a it's a thinner dark blob. Um, have I mixed pastels and colored pencils together on a project? Uh, no, I have not. Um, and I've I I've been asked that before, and I don't think I ever will, because I just like the consistency of either one or the other medium. So when I when I work with pastels, I like all of the consistency of the final artwork to have the same texture and look. Pastels have that that super sweet like velvety smooth finish uh, that colored pencils just doesn't have at all. Colored pencils has like the heavier like like waxier kind of glossy type finish um, and uh, it, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, it it kind of feels like I don't know. Uh, there's so the um, canvas material that like school book bags are made out of that that plasticky like uh, what, vinyl type material. Uh, when I think about that material, it's it's kind of similar to some people that have problems with fingernails on a chalkboard kind of thing. Um, makes your teeth hurt. Uh, so when I think about when I think about that material of book bags, it makes, makes my teeth hurt. Uh, and when I think about colored pencils and pastels together, it kind of I kind of have that same uh, reaction. I just uh, it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> There's there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I mean, you can totally uh, mix those two mediums and they they'll work. Uh, but uh, the uh, the final texture just doesn't just doesn't work. My teeth don't like it. <laughs> Gotta darken in uh, a few of the shapes up here. few uh, few darker spots over here as well I'm just gonna add some more brown the 947 uh, and then there is more brown <clears throat> it's kind of this uh, kind of this uh, shape coming up like this I already have it mapped out I forgot to get water. I already have the shape mapped out, but uh, it needs more brown. So I'm gonna add some, some brown to this shape here. I'm avoiding using any um, 
horse uh, terms or animal anatomy terms. This is just a shape that needs to be more brown. It's not a neck, it's not a horse. It's just a shape of brown, a brown gray, something like that. Uh, and these, these, uh, these shapes back here, they need a little bit of red too. Uh, so I'm using uh, 944. This is a nice uh, reddish brown. It's going to make these shapes look better. <laughs> um, where is my confusion on when to pay attention to direction of fur? Uh, I thought I understood it always to go direction of the fur, but I see I am wrong on that. Uh, so Steve, uh, I, I'm, I'm making an exception. Um, maybe you missed the, uh, the first part of the live stream where I was talking about uh, this strategy that uh, I'm implying, uh, applying here with this, this horse, uh, because I'm, I'm, ignoring, I'm ignoring all of my previous rules to try something different. Um, Instead of, you know, instead of, I'm not drawing a horse, Steve, so therefore the idea of fur direction does not apply um, with this new strategy that I'm trying out. I'm not drawing a horse, this is just a bunch of shapes that I've, that I've colored. They're just a bunch of shapes. Um, therefore, they don't have fur and there's no specific direction that I have to go. So you're you're no con, no confusion necessary uh, because I'm not I'm not coloring a horse, just coloring in shapes. Shapes don't have fur. I'm just focused on color and shapes. Just following the shapes. Uh, this reddish color has this. Uh, has this pattern that runs down this line here, kind of like this. There's more red showing up right in this area. And then there's kind of this oval shape of red that pops up like right in this, this, uh, this area here. It's just a little bit more red in this kind of oval shape and it runs down over here, kind of creeps in where this uh, darker line shows up. Um, and then in this dark shape here, it starts to get a bit more red and then it kind of fades away into more of a grayish black brown as it gets down here. Um, let's see. And then the other color that's kind of showing up a lot. The other color that is uh, showing up a lot is uh, my my favorite ninja purple, and this color shows up a lot at the at the edges of this dark shape here, and it's it's kind of a transitionary color that shows up in everything. If you know anything about ninja purple, you know it's always in the shadows. It is always in everything that you ever color. You might as well always have ninja purple. And it's kind of a transition where this dark shape starts to bleed into this lighter shade of purple, kind of a purplish pink color. And this color also shows up over here, kind of in kind of in like uh, two stripes. You can you can see that I have these stripes kind of blocked out already. But this ninja purple is kind of the uh, basis of transition. And then right next to that like reddish oval, right along the edge, uh, beside this, uh, this black uh, line, this black line, because it's just a black line. It's not 
It's not hair. This isn't hair. It's not the mane of a horse, because it's just a black shape. And this is just a bit of ninja purple next to a red oval. And there's a little bit of it showing up here. Uh, the other, the other color kind of showing up in this, this strip of lighter color, is uh, nectar, which is 1092. It's a bit brighter than the ninja purple. Touch more red. Has a little bit more red. So in between these dark shapes kind of creates a somewhat of a resemblance to a highlight. And then up here there's kind of these two lines that are coming from this, uh, this pointy triangle shape here, this kind of pointy triangle that you see up here at the top. Uh, there's kind of these lines that come down here and you see two you see two lines like running next to each other if you unfocus your eyes you can kind of see a subtle subtle line coming from here to here and from here to here and that just has a little bit of this color running through there a little bit And up here, this color fades in. Just a tiny bit. All right, and I'm going to use just a, a touch of the 927 to cover up the paper here. Is Ninja Purple a Prismacolor pencil? No, Ninja Color is just a it, Ninja Purple is just a color. It's not. It's not the real name of the color, Stacy. Uh, the real color is Clay Rose. <laughs> Should have clarified that. Um, Ninja Purple is my color. <laughs> uh, in uh, Prismacolor, they call it Clay Rose. I like my name better, and it's ten seventeen. Can somebody, uh, somebody's gotta bring Stacy up to speed on, on what Ninja Purple is and how important it is to know what Ninja Purple is. Steve, yeah, I think you got this one. Anyways, I'm just gonna cover up the rest of the paper here with this, uh, 927 color. And, uh, then I'm gonna blend out with solvent. I'm gonna blend my shapes out. Of solvent. I'm gonna add actually I'm gonna add a touch of black. I'm gonna add a touch of black kind of down the center a little bit of uh, sorry I need to darken this spot. This this spot's too bright. I'm gonna add a bit of red in there too. Um, down the center part of this darker shape. That way I centralize like the line and just uh, just gives me more um, more pigment to move around when I grab my brush and my solvent. Just kind of scribble in a bit of black there. All right, now I'm gonna crack open my zested <clears throat> and I did not check to see if my brush is clean. So I need to do that. Piece of, piece of tissue. Grab a little tissue. Um, I don't see any color coming off. Yep, looks clean to me. You always want to make sure your brush is clean. I never clean my brush from blending with uh, blending colored pencils. It's a pretty bad habit. 
but I always double check my brushes anyway. I'm going to start in the light areas. I'm going to start in the light areas first. And I'm just going to start smoothing out the pigment before moving into any of my darker shapes. Uh, new brush? This No, this isn't a new brush. Um, I use, I have two brushes that I blend with, uh, that I that I blend colored pencils with. The, the infamous number eight round brush uh, that I still have. Uh, and then I also have this number four round brush, which I use when I'm working on small drawings. Uh, don't use it too often, but uh, I, I, I do use it uh, when I use, when I draw small and as you can see the the shapes here are rather small the these are small shapes what I'm what I'm looking for when blending out these shapes here is to soften any harsh, harsh, I have a hard time saying that word, harsh ed edges. So uh, I don't want any obvious lines showing up. I want my shapes to be ambiguous. I don't want to be able to see where one shape ends and the other begins. That's that's kind of uh, kind of what I'm what I'm looking for to make sure that uh, my shapes just all kind of bleed into each other. Feel like I got the lighter shapes blended rather well, so I can I can start getting into some of my darker shapes now. Pulling in some of those darker browns, and some of these uh, some of these colors are going to appear darker at first, uh, simply because they're wet with the solvent but they will even out once it once they dry If you guys have any other questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, have an issue when you use when to use a solvent and when not to. When are the times one would use a solvent? Uh, like after so many layers, are there any other considerations when to use a solvent? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, Steve. Um, generally, it's, I, I can, uh, well, I'll just say that it's kind of a personal preference. Some people may use a uh, solvent to start blending their colored pencils like right away, like they'll just do like a couple colors, they'll just lay down a couple quick layers or something and then they'll smooth it out with solvent. Um, and then there might be some people that are more extreme that, uh, you know, they basically get to the stage of burnishing before they ever blend with solvent. Um, and then you have me, I'm in the middle. Uh, my, my general rule uh, when it comes to blending with solvent, let me address let me address your first question, which is, when should you, opposed to when shouldn't you? Um, 
I use solvent to blend colored pencils in virtually every colored pencil piece of work I ever create uh, because it just makes things faster. Uh, I, I could get the same effect if I just continue to layer over and over and over and over and over and over again and I'll just cover up the paper but it'll be slower and it basically looked the same. I mean you won't really get you, you don't really get a special effect for the most part using solvent and uh, as opposed to just layering constantly until it's burnished completely. Um, but there's there's one exception for me and this is personal. Uh, it's not uh, it, not everybody's gonna follow this and I wouldn't expect everybody to. And that's when I color portraits with colored pencils. I don't use solvent in the skin. I don't like the way it makes the skin look. Um, and so I don't use solvent ever when I color the skin of a, of a person. And that's the only time I don't use solvent. Other than that, I use it in, in every stage and part of, of uh, colored pencil drawing. Now, your other question is when do you, when to use it like in terms of like what layer of color do you use it on? Uh, and this is this is another personal thing. Uh, like I said, you have kind of a spectrum in which uh, you have people at the extreme sides of both both ends where one person will wait until the paper's pretty much burnished and then the other one where they they lay down one pencil stroke and they think it needs to be blended with solvent. Um, I think that uh, if you wait too long, then you're not getting the most of your solvent because it saves time, it covers the paper faster, you can use a little bit less of your pencils if you, you know, blend them, spread them out with a solvent. And then you have the people that uh, they do it way too fast, way too soon, and unnecessary because there's not enough pigment laid on the paper for it to really do anything at all, and they're just wasting a bunch of solvent. Um, and then you have me, where I think that uh, I've I've kind of I've kind of maximized the uh, the benefit and minimized the uh, the amount necessary because a bottle like this. This is 250 milliliters. This this will last me two years at least. One bottle of solvent for all of my colored pencil work, all of the tutorials that I do, everything that I color. One 250 milliliter bottle will last me like two, maybe even three years. Um, and what I find is that uh, I get the most out of the solvent when I have a generous amount of layers on the paper already. And I usually, eh, four, five layers of pencil. What, I, what I'm looking for, what I'm looking to get before using solvent um, is, is based a lot on experience. And you can't, you can't skip experience. There's no, you can't teach experience. You can only gain experience by doing it over and over and over and over and over for many years. And when you, when you have a certain degree of experience with working with colored pencils and solvent, you get to a point where you know where you want to blend with solvent. Like you might add five layers and you're like, hmm, you know what, I want to add this one last color because from experience, I know that it's going to blend into the other colors and look really nice, and it's going to get the effect that I want. Um, and you can't teach that, and you can't uh, boil it down to add five layers, blend with solvent, add five more layers, blend with solvent. You can't break it down uh, systematically like that. You have to. It, it all comes down to experience, and the the thing is like. If you blend out with just one layer of pencil, it's very light, you didn't mess anything up, it's fine. Just add more color after it dries, and then blend again when you feel comfortable. Um, and then as you gain more and more experience, you'll find, well, if I would have just skipped 
blending after the first, second, and third layer, and just continued applying my colors, I would have only had to blend once to get the same effect as a blending five times if you did it after each individual layer. So, um, you know, you just, you just want to continue to use the technique over and over again until you gain the experience that tells you, okay, now is when I want to blend because I, I know I'm going to get the effect that I want. Um, oh, uh, so why I don't use solvent for skin. I don't think I actually did uh, explain that fully. Um, so if you, if, you take, if you take a color, just uh, take whatever color, pick your favorite color, maybe it's orange. Uh, color in a square on a piece of paper. Um, color two of them, actually. On one of them, I want you to just burnish the paper. Just burnish it, make it look really smooth and painter, like paint-like, okay? On the other square, just blend it with solvent to cover the paper, and then stand back, let it dry, and then compare the, the two squares. Tell me which square you like more. For me, I like the burnish square. It's more work, it's harder to do, it takes longer, but it looks better. And the colors are more vibrant. Um, whereas the you'll notice on the solvent square that even though the color is still bright, looks good, and it actually looks a little more soft, um, it looks dry. It looks dried out because solvent, uh, you know, it's kind of like alcohol on your skin dries your skin out and that's what it does to the color it dries it out and it makes it it, it gives it a foggy look to it. it gives it a fogginess so just try it on a piece of paper and tell me i'm wrong because of all the solvents that i've ever used you get the same slightly foggy look with every color um and that's why i don't like to do it on skin because I don't want my skin to look foggy and um, dead. I just feel like burnishing the skin without using solvent, uh, you get more life in the skin, minus the fogginess. Could be wrong. I could just be seeing things, but it's my personal preference. That's why I said it's a personal preference. I'm not, I'm not right about anything, and I'm not wrong about anything. Uh, it's just, it, it just boils down to personal preference, and I don't like the way it looks. Oh, what do you mean I burnish with what? I, I, uh, burnishing is just a, burnishing is just a, uh, a process of layering to the point that the color is like glossy smooth you can i mean you technically can burnish with a um a colorless blender you can burnish with a colorless blender and i do use a colorless blender on skin to do some to do some smoothing and filling in like pinholes But I have, I have like uh, three, I think I have three uh, tutorials, um, three tutorials on portraits that you can do. Uh, do I still see the same fogginess if you do the first couple layering with blending uh, and then coloring the final layers with burnishing? Most likely you won't. So like if you if you uh, do some layers, blend with solvent, and then layer on top, and then take that to burnishing without you know adding uh, solvent anymore, um, I, I I doubt that you'll see I doubt that you'll see the fogginess. Um, but I just uh, 
when when doing skin i the colors usually uh f well for me from my experience the the colors just seem to be very subtle um and they change very subtly and i i, I think that that would be harder to get with solvent and, and you know i probably could try i could i know i did um I, I did this this is a, a portrait tutorial that I that I did last year on patreon uh, and I spent like like three hours or something live streaming to do this tutorial and I still needed to get the skin smooth so I had all the colors laid down where I needed them to be. All I needed to do was continue to layer to um, to get the skin smooth. But I was getting tired. Like I was three hours or something. I, I, I don't know how long I was streaming. It felt like three hours. Um, I was getting tired. I was getting hungry. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get this done. Because back then I was doing Patreon live streams that um, I, I would finish... I would finish the project in, in a single live stream. Um, that, that's why it's so small. Um, but uh, I just decided, you know what, I'm just gonna grab a brush and I'm gonna just blend this out. So after a ton of layering, I, I just blended it once with a brush. Um, and the skin is, uh, the skin lost its richness. It just lost its richness. And I, I guarantee you that I could probably layer colors on top of this the colors that I used to bring that richness back um, but uh, at this stage um, it it has it has like a fogginess it has a foggy color because the last thing that I did was was blend with solvent Anyways, I, th I think I'm going to let this dry. I blended out enough. Yeah, I think the you, most likely you're not going to see the fogginess on camera. I see it in person, which is why it bothers me. Um, but like I said, there's no... It, it, it's not like you can't do a portrait and blend the skin with with a solvent i mean of course you can and i'm sure i'm, I'm sure that you can make them look wonderful <laughs> it's just personally i don't like to <laughs> that's that i that's what it comes down to you know um some people don't like to don't like pastels um can't doesn't make them wrong <laughs> just means they don't like it um so yeah everybody has their you know their personal taste when it comes to uh, everything i in in no way would i say somebody's wrong for using the uh, uh solvent to, to blend their skin it's just uh, i like the look in person better Oh, you never, okay, so you never leave the, uh, the blended layer as the final layer. Yeah, I don't, um, it's, it's never the last thing that I do. Yeah, blending with solvent is never the last thing that I do, so I'm right there with you. I was trying to think of anything that I might do that with. Um... Maybe, I mean, maybe with fur, I might do like a last brush, but it wouldn't be a blend. It would be just be more like a softening uh, with solvent. But uh, yeah, I would say that uh, with the exception of that portrait right there, because I literally blended with solvent. I was like, all right, everybody, I'm done. I'm going now. Um, 
I always thought I would hate pastels because of the mess. I only gave them a try because of of, of me. <laughs> well, I, yes, Stephanie, I, I, I remember you. Um, I remember you telling me that when you got pastels and how much you enjoyed them. And I'm glad that you did. Yeah, they are a lot of fun, even though eh, sometimes they can get a little messy. Oh, good morning, Lady Marigold. Uh, need in need more info on colored pencils. Uh, would your course uh, intro to colored pencils help me out? Uh, so why don't you ask me what information that you that you need to know with colored pencils? Um, I mean, there's a lot of techniques. I cover a lot of techniques and basics uh, in my intro to colored pencil course. But if if you just need like some answers. Uh, I'm not going to sell you a course that I that I think I could probably just answer on on the live stream today. Uh, but if you're getting into, I mean, if you're interested in getting into colored pencils, then then I, I, I would recommend, and I think a lot of people in the live stream chat would probably reckon, recommend my intro to colored pencil course because a lot of people have taken it. Uh, you're doing the uh, cartoon challenge. Awesome. Uh, in acrylic, that is that is totally acceptable. Um, like I mentioned, the uh, coloring competition is wide open for any medium that you wanted. You could do it in coffee if you wanted. Uh, anyways, I think my papers, I think my papers dry. Uh, the the one downside, the one slight downside to this paper here is that uh, it does take a little while for the solvent to dry, and you have to be careful with that. You don't want to rush into coloring after you after you blend with solvent uh, because you can ruin the paper. Oh, you are welcome, Lily. I was uh, I was happy to do the uh, critique of your your drawing there. Uh, pastels are a lot more forgiving than colored pencils. Yes, absolutely. Um, am I doing Inktober this year? Yes, uh, Viking, I am. And I, I I'm going to I, I plan on scheduling out the streams like right now, basically. Um, I think that's what I'm going to do this week is I'm going to plan out like I'll make the thumbnails and everything uh, and I'll schedule out the live streams so that they're always happening and, and people know that they're happening and I'll, I'll schedule them out so that you can see I'm doing everyday live streams for the entire month. I still haven't even looked. I have not even looked uh, at the prompt list for this year. Um, and next Monday is day one of Inktober, so I'm, I'm a little far behind here. You do coffee paintings, Lily? Uh, yeah, you can, you can do the boot house and coffee. Uh, get a hair dryer to accelerate the drying process. Yeah, I could, but does anybody want to listen to a hair dryer, hair dryer on a live stream? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start. Uh, I'm gonna start filling in the shapes on the horse here. I a little bit of. Uh, I got a little bit of reddish brown in that 944 color. I have a couple shapes going on here. I kind of have this. Uh, this little arch here and a slightly larger shape right here and uh, another one that's kind of going like this kind of another oval type shape uh, let's see what else we got here this uh, triangle spike um, have a little bit of brown 
red come in here and for the most part I have this shape coming up like uh, kind of kind of like this like I said I'm just looking at the shapes just just matching the shape and throwing the color in to the shape so it's kind of like this I feel comfortable with that And then back here, um, back here I have this uh, this brown shape coming in. And then I have a I have a brighter orange happening in this, uh, and I'm going to use a really bright orange. I'm going to grab. Is this the right color here? Nope. Where's it at? I know it's here somewhere. There it is. I have a much brighter orange coming down in these shapes because I think that these shapes are being hit directly by the sun. Whereas most of these shapes are actually on the shadow side of the shape of the larger shape in general. A few of these shapes up here might be being hit. Uh, I feel like there's a little bit of this this orange being uh, right in here, just a touch. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the transition down here has a bit of this orange. So I'm just going to Scribble it in there a little bit. These shapes here, a bit of that orange. Not a whole, there's not a whole lot going down uh, in this uh, this spot here. So Th this orange shows up a lot in the transition between the darker shapes and the lighter shapes. So I'm just going to add a little bit and then rely on the solvent blending it out. Uh, will this be available not live after you're done? Would love to watch it again. Yes, uh, all of my live streams are automatically uploaded to my YouTube channel so that you can watch them as many times as you want and pause it whenever I make a weird face. Uh, you might even be able to... I, I think you can go backwards on the live stream as well. Um, I, I don't know how far back you can go like while I'm actually live but I know that um, I know that they're automatically uploaded to my channel after I go after I uh, sign off so yeah you can definitely watch them as many times as you want so I'm gonna grab some of my ninja purple Uh, I feel like there's kind of a uh, darkish purple slash ninja purple shape right in here. And then it creeps over into this shape, kind of like this. And that makes this lighter shape stand out a bit more. And then my nectar color. Uh, did you just pay attention to the shapes in regardless to the the veins on the cheek? Veins on veins on what cheek? 
Shapes don't have veins, Stacy. <laughs> um, it's it's all about the shapes. Yeah. So, uh, whatever your whatever cheek or vein you might be referring to, Stacy, I can assure you that uh, that this is just a collection of shapes and colors. Shapes of very specific colors, but that is all. The horse's blood veins. Again, Stacy, I think you're mistaking. This is just shapes and colors. Everything, everything that I colored here was in regards to a shape and a color exactly what I'm doing now, which is why I'm not referring to any anatomical part of any animal at all, because I am I'm only drawing shapes of a very specific color. Not, I'm not taking anything else into account. These, these shapes up here, uh, these, these shapes that I, that I believe you might be referring to, uh, if you look, I can trace them out. I'm just going to zoom in. I'm going to trace them out. And this is how I drew the shape. This is, this is, I, I literally drew the shape. And then what I did is I used I used all my other colors like I did back here to soften the edges so that those shapes have softer edges and they don't really have a beginning or an end. Yeah, they don't they don't have a beginning or an end because I just drew shapes and then I used um, I use the other colors to soften those edges. Exactly. Now you now you're getting it. Oh, that's the wrong color. Grab a little bit of this darker brown. gray I think uh, maybe not a gray what color am I thinking hmm. 10 10 9 3 yeah 10 9 3 seems good You're very welcome, Watcher. Oh no, it broke. I. Yeah, you you, you might be like the the third or for, fourth person uh, Watcher that has referred to me as being funny. That's that's rare. That's rare. I'm not using this color. I, I don't feel like fighting with my pencil sharpener. I'm just gonna use this one instead. This is 1085. This is kind of a, uh, a little bit of a sandy flesh tone color. What is it called? It's called peach beige. Uh, that's appropriate. There's there's a lot there's a lot happening in this 
shape here, but uh, I'm just focused on, on matching the color the best that I can before uh, adjusting the, the details within the shape. Just kind of get the, uh, the basis of the color a bit. And I'm going to use some of my gray uh, to add in some value. I need to go darker with my, with my color over here. And a bit more reddish brown, I think. It has some of the ninja purple around the edges, just like this here. But um, the reddish brown I see coming deep into this uh, darker area. Uh, could I list the supplies I am using for Inktober? Actually, I intended on doing a video. Hopefully I can still do that. Um, uh, I, I wanted to make a video sharing all the supplies that I was going to be using. And then of course in the description of all my live streams, uh, I'm going to have all the supplies that I'm using as well. Um, but hopefully I, I'll get that to you, to everyone regardless. So it will be there, uh, Tatiana, don't you worry. I'm going to grab some of my reddish brown. Just add that in here. When that that gray and the black and everything and the brown here mix together, it's going to it's going to create the color that I want. I know that because of experience. Um a little bit more of this reddish brown, I think. Some of these shapes. Uh, would this video be of? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. Okay, Steve answered it. Uh, burnished can look very shiny, so if you don't burnish the whole thing, you'll have some areas really stand out and I don't like that. So do you burnish your whole drawing equally? Uh, if you want consistency, then that's what I would recommend doing. Uh, I'm trying to think of... Hmm. Seeing if I have an example behind me. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an example of something that's not burnished plus burnished. So something that has like a part of it that's burnished and then a part of it that's not. Uh, anyways, I'm gonna darken up a little bit. I'm gonna add a bit of gray into these shapes as well. Just to desaturate, pull back the, uh, the color a bit before blending. Add a little bit of gray up here as well. And let's see, a touch of this peachy color. There's not, there's not a whole lot to this area. There's not a whole lot going on. I could probably add some more layers, but uh, I feel comfortable enough to grab my solvent and just do a bit of blending. Make sure my brush is relatively clean before going into these highlighted spots here. And I'm, I'm using a rather generous amount of solvent. Um, this uh, this hot pressed watercolor paper that I'm working on is uh, very ab absorptive, uh, and 
it doesn't spread out as much. If you work on thinner papers, the, the solvent can uh, feather uh, where when you put it, it kind of like starts to branch out a little bit and it sometimes can pull your color. Uh, but on this watercolor paper, it doesn't do that, which is nice, mm, really nice actually. That's why I kind of like working on it. It's been a long time coming working on this uh, this Fabriano watercolor paper. All right, the highlights are done, or the the light shapes are done. So now I can move into the darker shapes a little bit. Um, okay, Chrissy, well, you have a good night, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for coming by. I'm not too concerned about keeping my shapes of any particular form. Uh, I'm, I'm letting I'm letting the solvent kind of expand the shapes and soften the edges. So I'm not I'm not sticking to anything real particular. Um, just letting the colors go about, spread out as far as I can get them. Because they won't go, uh, they won't go that far. They won't go far enough to ruin anything. So I want them to appear softer. Avoid avoiding the harsh edges is kind of my goal. See, this one here has a bit of a harsh edge because the color next to it is so light. So when I do my next layer, I'll uh, take that into consideration and try to add a color there, a transitionary color that will help me bridge the gap between the dark color and the light color. Oh, hello, Leontine. Uh, yeah, it has been a while since I've seen you on a live stream. I'm glad you were able to make it. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, what paper am I using? Wait, where'd it go? Um, yes. So, Steve, I am using a new paper today. This is, uh, this is the first time that I've used this paper. But most of you probably know this paper. Um, it's Fabriano hot pressed watercolor paper, uh, 300 pound watercolor paper. So it's it's the really really thick. You can see just how thick, super thick paper. Um, but uh, I've I've had this in my drawer over there for like a year. I I bought it forever ago. But I just never used it. I never tested it on anything, and um, I, I was reorganizing my drawer last week or whenever it was, and uh, I saw this paper and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna. I don't care what I color next, what I draw next. I'm gonna do it on that paper. Gosh darn it! I had it forever, and I was like, it's time. It's it's time to do it. Oh, hello, Wicked Illusions. Uh, thank you very much, Homer. Uh, I appreciate that, and I'm glad that you enjoy the streams. Is it extra white? Um, if it is, if it if it is extra white, I'm a bit disappointed. Uh, it's it it feels it looks a little bit more like ivory um, it's not if it is extra white I am disappointed in what they refer to as extra white um, 
Regardless, it's still super good, and I, I look forward to using it again. But I, I don't think that I got the extra white. Maybe I missed that. But like I said, if it is the extra white, it's a bit disappointing. Or if it's the extra white, I don't want to see what's not extra white, because it, it, it has a very ivory tint to it. It's much more ivory. Or eggshell. Eh, maybe not quite eggshell, but definitely ivory. Oh, hello, Robin. Thank you very much. Though everybody in the live chat will tell you that we're not coloring a horse. We're just coloring shapes of a very specific color. I'm not going to concern myself with blending out the edges there. Uh, I guess in the end, I still want it to look like a colored pencil drawing, so I think I'm just going to leave those, leave those hanging. There. Now i got to kind of sit here and wait for it to dry before I can add any other colors, any more layers to it, because I still have quite a bit of the paper showing through. Yeah, uh, DT, um, I, I can only get the paper in sheets, and um, I can only buy them from the UK, and it's super expensive to have them shipped. It's like, I don't know, like 10 pounds per sheet. Or something ridiculous maybe it's like seven or eight or something I don't know it's it's pretty expensive just to buy this sh a single sheet um, and then it's like twice that to have them shipped here because you know they can't fold it so they have to ship it in this giant box flat box that uh, um, yeah that uh, costs a lot in shipping so it's, it's, it's rather annoying, uh, which is why I probably won't end up always using this paper for my colored pencil work. But uh, I have, I, I bought like three, two or three sheets, like A1 sizes, and I just cut them all up into uh, smaller manageable pieces. So I won't be doing anything huge anytime soon. I'm just going to fan this a little bit so that it dries. Yeah, I there's like one there's like one art store in Katavisa where I live and um it has it has like these racks of paper, but it doesn't have any good paper. <laughs> it has like it has Canson paper. It has it has Fabriano paper. It does not have this paper. Um, does not have this paper. Um, they have they have racks that say Fabriano on them, but it's not filled with Fabriano paper. There's like one. There's like one sheet of Fabriano, uh, cold pressed. Um, uncut edge watercolor paper and but they have like this giant rack it's like a whole wall of paper but it all sucks um so i never get paper there uh they sell like super extra cheap canvases which i i hate canvas um and they also sell like these really cheap um not i don't know if they're canvas boards they're kind of like a hybrid they they have like a subtle they have like an artificial uh, uh, texture like an artificial canvas texture on them like glued to I don't know some cheap wood that's real flexible um, but yeah they have they they do have some good pastels they have some good inks they have some um, 
They have, they have good markers, uh, and they have some good paint. Uh, will a store order what I want? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if I, maybe, maybe, but I have to go all the way into town, and I don't like to, and it just takes forever, and yeah. I do actually need to go there. I need, um, what do I need? I know, oh, I need, I need uh, supplies for oil painting. Um, I need some, uh, some solvent uh, to clean my brushes, and I need a larger palette. Um, I, I, I haven't been able to work on my oil painting for like a week. One, I'm waiting for the paint to dry before I start the next element. Uh, but um, I need a larger palette because right now I have one that's like the size of this. It's like a palette this size um, and it's just not big enough. I have no room to mix my paint. <laughs> Uh, I always hear size of paper referred to as A1 and A2 and such. What size is what? Um, okay, so uh, America is on the uh, standard measurement system. Uh, the rest of the world is on a real measurement system called the metric system. Uh, and the printer paper that the rest of the world uses is A4. And A4... I think is, I don't know the exact measurements. I think it's like, somebody help me out here. What's what's A4? Anyways, the, the, the paper, it's just a paper size. Um, A1 is like real big. It's like the size of my desk. It's like, like 100 centimeters by like 80 centimeters or something. Um, it's just big. A1 is big. Um, and just know that as the, the number increases, the size goes down. <laughs> so A1 is exactly twice the size of A2. A2 is exactly twice the size of A3, and, and then so forth. Mm, let's see, what other question do I have here? Uh, don't I gesso the canvas? No, because I never use canvas. Uh, but you would gesso canvas. Um, I just don't like texture. I'm painting on panel, and I always love to paint on panel. If you've never painted on panel, if you've never painted on panel, do yourself a favor and try it. You still gesso. I you you gesso panel too. Um, but if you've never tried panel, uh, you're missing out. It's so much better. It's so much better than canvas. Um, phones always work. The local art store here is very accommodating. I believe you, uh, Bonnie. I do. Um, there's two problems. One, they don't speak English at the art store. And two, I don't speak Polish. So, communication problem there, especially over the phone. Um, at least in person I can point at things and be like, uh, can I have that? <laughs> uh, how long does oil painting take to dry? Uh, Stephanie, it depends on the thickness that you apply the paint. Uh, on the first part of my painting, uh, I did palette knife, just complete palette knife. The paint is probably about, th I don't know, maybe three to five millimeters thick. So it's rather thick. Uh, that's going to take about six to eight months to dry. Uh, and then on the other part, uh, I used real thin layers. Um, so that will probably take about a month to, to, to be fully dry. There's a, there's a difference uh, between being dry and being fully dry. Um, right now, I can actually touch my painting and I won't get any paint on my fingers, but that doesn't mean it's dry. Because with oil painting, the... It, it dries on top first and then beneath it will take more and more time for it to dry and uh, it's not dry until it is um, until it's like room temperature when you touch it it's still wet underneath if it if it feels cool when you touch it or maybe it's warm 
No, no, no. It's it's cool because the object should be room temperature, but it stays cool because the paint is drying. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, you have painted on panel once. I think it is way. It was too smooth. Uh, okay, just too smooth. That was was not way. <laughs> But I should try it more. Can you recommend recommend somewhere to buy it? Um, I I buy my panel from Jackson's. Uh, I don't remember, Lily. Aren't aren't you in the UK? I can't remember where you're from, Lily. I usually am really good at this, but I don't know if I ever figured out where you live. Or wait, no, you're in. Wait a minute, don't tell me, Lily. You live in. Uh, Ireland? Is that right? I think so. I, I get it from Jackson's, and uh, they have they have really nice panel there. So, um, yeah, you can just order it from there. Um, I'd love to see you following along to a Bob Ross tutorial. I Denmark? Wow, I was way off. <laughs> well, anyways, you can order from Jackson's in Denmark, <laughs> and that's where I get my panel. Um, yeah, I will maybe potentially do that in the future, Stephanie. That would be that would be fun to do, a live stream following along with Bob Ross, although I kind of have an unfair advantage um, as opposed to somebody that doesn't paint <laughs> trying to follow along, but it would be fun to see how it comes comes out. All right, this should be dry. I can I can add some more colors now, and I'm gonna start with a bit of the bright orange, the 1003, and I'm just gonna warm up, warm up these colors a little bit with a light layer of this. I'm not gonna do too much of it. This this color shows up very subtly, and I don't want to overdo it. So I'm just gonna kind of scribble it in there a little bit, and then leave it alone. You are welcome. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna grab my Ninja Purple uh, and do a little bit of light layering where this color is coming through. These transitionary spots here. I'm gonna use it uh, back here as the transition color. Uh, to feather that edge so it doesn't show up so much. A little bit right here. As you apply more and more layers, the paper will get smoother. So when you um, just add like a few pencil strokes of the color uh, and then you blend out with solvent, you can get a, a smooth finish. And that's kind of what I'm going for here. Just get the smooth finish by multiple layers. Use a little bit of this to add more color. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Steve, you're right. Um, it's been long since I've made a live stream. I miss it so much. Very, very looking forward to your Inktober streams. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I am. I am too. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it a little bit. My uh, my wife was asking me why I don't just do like you know a, a couple a couple of the prompts like each each other day instead of streaming every day because she she uh, knows how how much work it it is for me to do the the daily streams. But I think it's a healthy challenge. I mean, it's just one month, right? Oh, hello, Ko. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, let's get some brown. There's a bit of a 
there's a bit of a disconnect between this this area here so I need to just rework these these shapes uh, a bit more and this is the kind like some of the details that show up in this area uh, they need to be addressed closer to the the final layering um, as opposed to at this stage because I, I got to do a bit more blending uh, but it's important to make sure that I have enough pigment on the paper so that the blend comes out much nicer uh, and this this shape here is a bit too thick I need to um, I need to shrink it a little bit but that's not an issue when you make when you make the the light shapes it's it's better to make them bigger than to make them too small because if you make them bigger they're very very easy to shrink with your darker colors but if you make them too small you almost can never make them the correct size after that so always make your lighter shapes larger than than you think they should be make them the size you think they are and then bigger than that and then you should be you should be good should be safe I'm gonna use a little bit of transition color around the edge here of the dark shape so that when I blend out I get that nice soft feather between the colors Uh, will you will I do a comparison video on which color strategy works better? Uh, I find the texture of the shapes in the neck area strange. Uh, directional coloring would be better, I think. Uh, well, I haven't done any texturing uh, on the neck at all, uh, which is why I would imagine that they look uh, a bit strange. And they look strange to me. If I if I if I put uh, put my strategy on pause for a moment and address the fact that I am actually coloring a horse, uh, there is no texture here yet. The last thing that I did was just blend out. Uh, I, and right now I'm just kind of filling in the shadows, getting the, the values and the colors of my, my shapes correct. Um, I did, like I said, I did texture the face. And the face, I think, looks... Uh, perfectly textured. Um, I could probably go back and uh, kind of, what was the term that I came up with? What was it? Fine, doing, doing, I don't know. Uh, doing some touch up on the, the details here uh, to bring out the features a, a bit more, bring out the, the texture a bit more. Uh, but for the most part, the face is actually just completely done. Uh, the hair I haven't done anything with except filled it in. I have no flyaways and it looks kind of like a, a solid plastic mohawk. Uh, but yeah, the, the neck is not complete. Um, but regarding your question of whether or not I'll do a, a comparison video, um, most likely not. Um, I, I probably will just I probably will just use the concept of, of coloring shapes and matching color. Um, throughout tutorials in general just so that both exist uh, on my channel and I'll you know I'll just because like I said this is the first time that I'm trying this where I ignore everything and I just focus on the shapes and color and though I think it's turning out really great um, I, I don't I haven't done it enough to really um, compare the two strategies. But I, I, I can say for sure that this is faster. At least it was, it felt faster for me. It felt like less guesswork. 
and for that reason I'll probably start approaching this approaching my my drawings with this technique more but I don't know if I'll do a direct comparison between the strategies because had I been using the strategy because I, I guess I can kind of do a, a verbal comparison um, to highlight what's different about this one and what's different about this uh, if you're not familiar with the, the way I would have approached other drawings uh, is that I'm working on a horse and that's what I would have been thinking about the entire time and the horse has fur and I can see the direction that the fur is growing on its neck here and the direction of the fur is going this way here and then it curls it starts to like curl down and then on the neck it's all coming down kind of vertically like this um, and all of my pencil strokes I would have emphasized this from the very beginning that your pencil strokes uh, should follow the direction of the fur they should just you know and I would have been making pencil strokes like this this is the this is the difference between what I'm doing now and what I would have been doing if I used the strategy that I always use I would have been doing pencil strokes like this you would have seen me coloring in the fur as fur and then I would have blended out and I would have done a, a continuous kind of layering process to match the color to match the value and I would have I've would been drawing the whole time I've been focused on okay uh, in this part of the horse the fur starts to get darker but I need to maintain that that pencil stroke I need to maintain that uh, that uh, fur direction and I would have been doing this the entire time uh, I got a great result on the face using this technique whether or not I would have gotten a better result had I done it the way that I usually draw furry animals um, I don't know maybe I can't say for sure uh, I think there's still work that I can do on the face to make it look better but uh, I don't think I missed anything I don't I don't think uh, I don't think I missed out on the texture or the details by doing it this way than if I were to have filled it in like this paying attention to my my pencil stroke the entire time Polishing, that's right. Thank you, Lady Marigold. Yeah, I knew I knew I was missing something. It's polishing. I don't know how I forgot that. I'm glad you picked up on that. That's great. <laughs> um, you can plan the pictures beforehand or, for examples, do one picture every other day or one picture per week. The most important is that you are consistent on the schedule you decide to follow. Yeah, um, I'm not even sure if you're talking to me on it, but... Uh, that, that was the same thing that my wife kind of suggested instead of the daily ones because the daily ones are not easy <laughs> it's not easy doing that a uh, live stream every day um, I don't forget how hard last year was but it was so much fun it was so much fun so um, I'm gonna do it regardless of how painful it uh, it, it feels during the, the process um, I always do a desaturated underlayer to make sure I get the structure and values correct. Then I go back and start adding in more structure, color, and then the fur detail. And I would say that uh, that's that's kind of the approach that I would say that uh, my my regular strategy employs. You know, kind of doing, kind of kind of building out the uh, the kind of mapping out where the colors show up while simultaneously kind of mapping out the direction of the fur and I would always be keeping those things in my mind um, fur direction color value all of that anatomy of whatever I'm drawing but I found with this approach that uh, that it's just easier to to ignore all of those those details and um, you know, I don't know how well this strategy will work with like longer fur animals, 
creatures. I'm not sure it's going to be as viable. Uh, I guess it just depends on how you do your color matching and then adding your texture over top of your colors. So this is, I, I have, I have kind of a twofold benefit here with this particular subject. One, the fur is really short. It's really short. So it doesn't have as much texture as a long haired animal, like a dog or a cat. Uh, the other thing is that this drawing is really small. I was testing it out. I, was, I, was, I tested this out on a really small drawing in the first place. So there's not a lot I can say about it. But I, what I can say is that, um, you know, if you're doing a larger picture and say, you know, you have a horse of this size in that picture and it's like maybe a landscape or something like that, then, then maybe you could approach the subject like this. But you can also, you can also approach it like this if you're painting. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know how I would approach uh, painting a horse with like acrylic or oil. But I think that I would approach it the way that I approach this with colored pencils. And I think that's where the, uh, the breaking up the color shapes and, and just focusing more on matching the specific color as opposed to doing texture from the very beginning. Um, I, it, it crosses it crosses many medium barriers. I, I'm not just talking about coloring and colored pencils, but you can approach this this thought process. It's just a, it's just a way of thinking uh, that I'm really explaining today. Um, you can approach this with acrylic painting, with pastels, with oil painting, with whatever medium you're doing, because um, the whole idea, the whole concept, the whole kind of uh, revelation, I guess, uh, if I could be so dramatic, um, is that I am ignoring what I'm coloring and I'm only focused on the shapes and matching the color. I, I, can't, I can't stress the importance of matching the color before applying it. Like, like the only goal is to match the color. And when you match a color, you're matching it both in value and in saturation, obviously. And, and I'm focusing more on just matching the color. I'm ignoring all of the technical stuff. And I'm not saying that that might be the best way to go, but what I am saying is that uh, it frees you up to make, it, it frees you up to making better color choices. And sometimes that's just what you need to focus on. Uh, a lot of people mess their colors up. They mess up values, they mess up saturation, they mess up their colors. And I think today that is what I perhaps wanted to focus on, but maybe not verbalized as well. Like I'm not trying to create the most realistic horse here. I'm just, I'm just kind of uh, having a discussion about color um, and applying it, a process of applying it because that's all I was focused on when I when I did this. Wasn't focused on fur or anything like that. Just color, just match the color. Uh, and I, I think that if you can match the color and then just apply that color in the specific shape that it appears in your subject, I think you're gonna find that you, you like the outcome of the piece better. I don't even know if I was answering a question right there. I was just kind of rambling, but um, hopefully if you had questions, I answered them. Um, sometimes it also really depends on if you can actually see individual hairs on the horse. Some horses get shaved and naturally very smooth. Yes, yes, I absolutely. And that's, that's what I was kind of alluding to when, um, when I was mentioning, like, if you're drawing like a portrait of a dog, you know, rather large. Obviously you have, you have textural details that you cannot avoid and get a realistic portrait. But, uh, but what if instead of, there, there's always gaps, there's always gaps in between the hairs. You can, 
you can still color match those gaps. You can still draw those very specific shapes that show up. And I, I think I'm going to do a hair tutorial that kind of uses this strategy a little bit. Um, and I'll break it down. But um, with yeah, with colored pencils, you don't have you don't really have the option of like doing large, uh, very large shapes and then going back over it and adding highlights. But you do with paint. You do with paint. But um, yeah, I, I I totally get what you, what you're saying there, and I agree. I don't think that you can just pick out a shape and throw a color at it. But uh, w when you're working large with fine details, but maybe you can. Maybe you can. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I think it helps observation skills that we all need to hone at, at times? Um, yeah, I think that it does. Um, I always say that, uh, like, uh, when I when I'm working with a student or whatever, I'm I'm often referring to I I, I often bring up the idea of like their eyes maturing and when when an artist looks at a picture that they're planning on using as a reference for for instance um, they don't look they don't look at the picture the same as somebody that's just looking at a picture um, it's a lot like uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time the past five years learning how to film things and in edit videos and because I've spent so much time kind of you know, working on that craft. I can't even watch movies the same. I make like, I make really weird comments during movies and TV shows and, and things like that. And I've gotten to the point where when I'm watching, I can watch a TV show and I know when they change directors. Like uh, my wife and I, we just started watching, um, going through the complete seasons of, ho of, of House and uh and i can tell between episodes when the director changes just because of the different shots and the way that the camera moves and all of that because the the director controls that um and i mean before i learned how to film and edit video i never noticed details like that and just like when you're an artist and you are trying to recreate an image on a piece of paper you can't just look at the picture like any other person would. Um, a non-photographer, non-artist just looks at a picture and sees a horse. But if you're a photographer, you're looking at light, you're looking at composition, you're you're looking at uh, you're looking at a bunch of stuff. And then even more, you're looking at even more when you're an artist. You're looking at the direction the fur is going you're looking at the reflection in the eye you're, i mean you're you're looking at so many different things so many different elements of the of the image that nobody else thinks about and so when you first start drawing from pictures or coloring from pictures you do a lot of things wrong and it's because you are drawing and you're coloring as you imagine the image to be uh, and this is why so many people draw inaccurately and they color inaccurately because they draw what they think they're seeing as opposed to what's actually there they're not they haven't quite developed the eyes to look at an image to to pull out the subtle details that they need to replicate in their artwork um, and that's what changes and uh, helping your observation skills, yeah. I mean, developing developing artist eyes takes time. I uh, hopefully I, I maybe I answered your question. Um, anyways, you guys you guys ask a lot of good questions, and I I'm just kind of rambling. I, I'm out of water here. My throat is getting dry. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I don't remember if I blended or not. I'm just gonna add some more color. I think I can I think I can safely add some color here. Uh, and then I'll blend again. Um, let's see. Is this I don't even know what color I'm using. I'm so lost. I'm so lost right now. 
Hey, Cece. Glad you were able to make it. You weren't very... You weren't asleep for very long. Hopefully you slept well. I'm gonna add some more red up here into the... into these shapes. And I think this needs a bit more purple. I'm actually... My eyes can focus. Uh, I think I need to add an actual purple. I kind of like uh, 995. Is it 995? Yeah, I kind of like this color. Uh, you did blend and then run for water. Oh, yeah. I, I could do that. Uh, I'll, I'll be okay. I'll survive. I'm going to add a touch of purple here. Um, and uh, Bonnie, I know that you're probably following the colors that I'm using. Um, this, this purple that I'm considering is not the right one. What the heck? This is, this is 9.30. It must have gotten mixed up. I'm looking for 9.95. Yeah, I'm looking for 9.95. That's the color I'm using. Um, yeah, I'm just going to add a, a, a very small amount of this purple in the transition. And back here a little bit. Probably incorporate some of this purple later on in the face, in the facial shapes going on here. I'm gonna add a little bit of it down here. This this is just a subtle color that I'm adding to further match. I want that's that's what I'm doing. Shapes and color, meaning I need to match the colors. And so I'm just using that uh, that subtle bit of purple to match the color uh, best that I can. And I just I sense a little bit of purple there. If you think about it, it makes sense that purple would show up a little bit because I have like this reddish, this deep reddish brown fur and then kind of have the bluish tint from a, from a shadow. So having, having a bit of purple makes sense. Uh, no, the uh, 995 is not a ninja purple because uh, it is very vibrant. It is, it is very purple and this color will show up like crazy. Ninja purple is always very desaturated um, and uh, the clay rose, the, the clay rose cl color, it's ninja purple because it's basically gray with a, a hint of purple. Why is it called burnishing? I have no idea. Honestly, I don't even like the term burnishing. I don't even like to say the word burnishing. I have no idea why it's called burnishing. Really don't know. Hmm. All right, I think I can blend. I'm gonna go ahead and blend now. That's, that's a really interesting question, Lily, and I don't have an answer for it. I do not know why it's called burnishing. Did you guys run out of questions? Should 
shall fall asleep. I might just uh yeah we can we can skip the word um I'm probably just going to finish up blending this and calling it a day uh, wait that can't be right that can't be right it is right um I didn't realize that I was streaming for so long yeah uh, I I was streaming Good thing, good thing I did the dishes uh, before um, before I started streaming, because I don't think I'd have time to, to finish them before my wife gets home from work. It's never good. It's never good being a stay-at-home husband. And the dishes not being done when your wife gets home? Don't do that. That is, that is not a good idea. Just for all of my fellow stay-at-home husbands. Don't let the dishes be dirty when the wife gets home from work. Not unless you want to enjoy your evening. <laughs> uh, I hope she never watches this live stream. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, maybe this is how I will approach painting my sister's dog. Don't draw the dog, draw the shapes. I think that's a good idea, Barbara. And I would also say, since you're, since you're going to be working with paint, um, match your color. Match your color uh, before you ever touch your canvas. So focus on making sure that you mix your paint to the exact color that you need, and then only apply it where you need it. Don't, uh, you know... No, no reason to uh, paint the whole canvas a particular color or just to cover it with, you know, the correct colors. Obviously, you have the benefit of uh, being much more forgiving than um, than uh, colored pencils. Oh, hello, Vignac. Vinayak. Hopefully, I pronounced that right. Uh, you kind of, you kind of uh, came in, came in a little bit late. I'm just doing a bit of blending here, uh, and then I'm going to jump off here and start making food, because that's another really good idea to have at least going before the wife walks into the door, walks in the door, through the door. You know, whatever people do with doors. Uh, the the last bit, so um, I'm I'm just about finished blending. Um, the the last thing that I'll do is the polishing stage. I got my colors matched. Uh, I'm I'm more than satisfied with uh, my colors here. I don't think there's there's much much matching that I need to do more or less uh, with my colors so the only thing that I really need to do is start thinking about the fact that I am coloring a horse instead of focused on just shapes and colors and now I can look at the now I can look at the reference photo and start replicating the textures so I'll, I'll do a little bit of it after I finish blending well, maybe I won't because I have to wait for it to dry and that's going to take forever. Um, what I'll do is I'll just uh, describe it now. Uh, so for instance, the fur texture. So I have some, uh, these, these highlights here, they're not just solid color like they are right now. I have some of the, uh, probably the, the brown, some of the brown streaks coming through the highlights to start... Uh, creating the illusion of fur by adding that texture and you can do that throughout all the dark parts as well and just start penciling in 
those those subtle lines and the, the key word is subtle the key word is subtle when you when you look at the reference photo the 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 fur is not obvious it's 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 generally just implied by subtle lines that show up around edges of the shadows and some some in the highlights a little bit but they're not like very prominent and obvious uh, and that's what you want to avoid you want to you want to avoid the obviousness of of uh, adding in the texture because the texture is often just very implied meaning that you only see the texture uh, because your mind is creating it and it's accentuating it more than you think it's actually showing up um, in most cases obviously there's exceptions to every rule but um, when when you look at your reference photo tr try not to try to not to like uh, tunnel vision on any particular uh, texture try to try try to find the texture and then kind of like back your eyes up a little bit and see what is happening in the image to create that texture like for instance uh, this spot here there's there's less lines and there's more like grouping of small like spots and that doesn't really create fur texture but it's important for the overall uh, texture to show up in general Anyways, I think that's uh, I think that's blended out enough. Like I said, there's still there's still a bit of polishing that I need to do for this horse, uh, but I'm going to go start dinner, let this dry, and then I'll finish up the details later, and I'll probably post an image, probably post a final picture of this uh, on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. Uh, but uh, anyways. Uh, next week, next Monday, starts day one of Inktober, meaning a whole month of just pain, suffering, and a lot of fun. So uh, I'm going to be live streaming every day starting next Monday, and they're probably going to be long streams, long and tiring, You're probably going to get super bored of hearing, hearing me talk and ramble on about nonsense. But uh, it's always fun. It's always fun, and uh, I am going to be sharing. I'm going to be sharing everybody's work as you as you complete the the prompts and then you send them to me. I'm going to be sharing them uh, at the beginning of each stream, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you were thinking about joining in, participating, trying to participate in uh, this year's Inktober. Uh, I definitely encourage you to do it. You don't have to do every day. You don't have to do every day. But and, and I'll still share your work. You know, if you just do one or two, that's fine. I'll, I'll still share it. There's no pressure. Um, it's just, it's all about being creative anyway. It's just going to be a lot of fun. And I look forward to hanging out with everybody uh, through the month. Um, but that's going to be it for today. Um, for those of you that support me over on Patreon, I'll be streaming Thursday. Uh, we're working on a graphite graphite tutorial uh, portrait. Uh, I'll show you that real quick. This is what we're working oops, wrong way. This is uh, what we're working on in uh, Patreon. So if you uh, if you're interested, that's there. And uh, yeah, other than that, I'll see you all on Monday and we're gonna have some fun and uh, have a great have a great week. I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.